So thank you for uh, being part of this discussion and for contributing your interviews to the book. Uh, I will shortly introduce the book and then, then we will proceed to discussion. So I wrote this book, Negative Psychoanalysis, with your help. And the full title is Negative Psychoanalysis for the Living Dead. And the general intention of the book uh, is to be an alternative to positively oriented therapeutic and self-help culture. So positive means if it means that it's aimed for to foster happiness and to and emotional well-being, this book rather uh, does the opposite. And the book is for those probably who are not able to relate for some reason to this positive general conventional framework and those who are maybe disillusioned or just th cynical or for various reasons, they have troubles relating to it. They, have troubles defining themselves uh, through the conventional positive framework, or they just feel that it's foreign to them, like it's foreign to me. And the book combines the perspective of philosophical pessimism and uh, depressive realism with uh, more oriented towards late Freud, late Freud who got disillusioned, lost faith in um, psychoanalytic cure and who comes close to pessimistic use of Schopenhauer. And this is a Freud who is emphasizing the central role of the death drive. And uh, so the book has three main chapters, each followed by discussion with you. And uh, three of my main chapters, they also partially is uh, our dialogues with you where I take some of your concepts and make them more negative in my opinion. So uh, I take your concepts and make them worse or miscomprehend them mm. and create out of this ridiculously expensive book that will make people even more depressed than they are now. That was the plan. So my first chapter, my first main chapter after the introduction is the living dead destructive plasticity. It's where I discuss self or individuality as a living dead, or I use um, Lacanian idea or concept of post-traumatic subject, as we are post-traumatic at the beginning. And I expand on Catherine's concept of destructive plasticity, and I attempt to see it as uh, universally applicable, so everyone are living dead. Destructive plasticity is Catherine's improved version of the death drive, so actual death drive, unlike Freudian death drive. And I also uh, show how recent research in neuroscience can validate the idea that we are the product of destructive plasticity or we are death driven. And in a second chapter uh, of main chapter, Dead Together, Love Hurts, that this chapter is uh, on the death drive as the basis of uh, sociality, as a basic social drive. So not just subjectivity is death driven, but also uh, death drive is interrelational. I elaborate on Todd's concept of a death drive as a social drive. I'll make it more negative by depriving it of the framework of discussing enjoyment. So uh, this is because it's problematic to discuss suffering uh, in using conventional psychoanalytic terms because we tend to admit enjoyment to it. So no enjoyment, only suffering that connects us. And I also uh, elaborate on some of the research in social cognitive neuroscience that precisely on social pain in this chapter. And the third chapter, uh, the tragic fairy tale of evolution. This is uh, the chapter that discusses nature as suffering or death driven as nature is self-destructive and I build upon Alenka's elaboration of Lacanian and Nietzschean uh, conceptions of nature, that I see nature as death-driven. And I also add Peter Wessel Zappe, one of my favorite pessimistic philosophers, to this discussion. And I discuss some contemporary research in evolutionary, uh, in the theory of evolution. And in conclusion and epilogue, I suggest the possibility the possibility there is doomed to failure often some kind of social negative 
practice. And um, on a personal level, this book that I wrote that you, and you helped me is the book. It's kind of a narration from the journey to the end of myself, to the end of my life. Uh, a narration more or less acceptable uh, in a form acceptable for academic publishing, even though um, it was less requirements for the, the format of a Bible where you can just write, <laughs> narrate out of you without, and it's less boring. But so it's narration of the night of the soul. You can say it's a voice of depression, but um, not seeing depression as something universal, universal human voice, not the voice of distortion that we need to fix. And I do consider myself a living dead. Yeah. And maybe it's um, and life, something, existence that I have is existence of a kind of afterlife or after that. And um, I, I am partially ashamed to claim so because there are people obviously um, going through much worse life circumstances, especially in Ukraine. But uh, maybe I don't deserve to be called that way. But uh, and it's certain hypocrisy in this because if I'm able, my my life can also be um, presented as a story of success, right? And the book is this book is one of the instances of this success, and even the ability to narrate, to put into words uh, something, the depression or something like that, is all also testifies that uh, I'm not living that yet. But nonetheless, writing books can be seen as a trauma response or as a coping mechanism or some kind of academic self-help <laughs> that doesn't help only makes things work worse. Um, Hannah Arendt once said that uh, in her interview that um, I will either study philosophy or I'll drown myself when she was younger and that was same for me. So um, philosophy was all I ever wanted in this part of um, of psychoanalysis. And, and now I'm thinking maybe I make a wrong decision, like I choose the, the wrong option and the other one was better. So um, I wanted to be someone in philosophy and maybe I am someone now, but uh, on this way, I got completely disillusioned in both philosophy and psychoanalysis and academic, especially academic world in, in general. So I lost it. I'm not able to see the success or it's something that I, want it's all i ever wanted and now i don't have it and the the only type of philosophy psychoanalysis i tolerate is something that i'm presenting in this book like the, the only thing i can relate to it's psychoanalysis that it's self-destructive uh, psychoanalysis or self-denying in philosophy that is self-denying kind of freud or psychoanalysis that commits suicide or i find it uh, honest and i'm able to relate to it a freud that Freud, who is admitting that it doesn't work. And this space, this negative space was um, where there is no illusion of hope anymore. Um, and there is nothingness in a place uh, from the, this place of nothingness. It's a place that I narrate and the place I'm trying to be devoted to. Um, so this losing philosophy, and it, it was one of my most substantial loss uh, in my life and I turn right now I still consider myself philosopher but I'm like a parody of myself or the uh, empty uh, or a joke empty shell it's like a priest without a god and from this instance I'm, I'm trying to speak with others through this book and this is what this book is about without trying to save anyone or improve anything like genuinely staying within the place of failure and place of nothingness and hopelessness. And this is the space I also wanted to talk uh, with you today. Maybe um, asking you if you can relate, if this resonates with you, and if life in general and life, your lives in particular can be comprehended adequately as a failure, even though you are an example of academic success and you are the role model for many people. Do you feel sorry for, those, for, 
for those people because I partially blame you <laughs> in my failure in this disillusionment. And do you see, um, can you comprehend the life? Is it adequate to comprehend the life through this perspective of your life in particular? Code. <laughs> okay. That's, am I like on your screen, the first one? Uh, okay. Uh, wow. Uh, yeah, I never, I guess I've never thought in terms of success and failure. Like, I don't, I don't think, like, I don't think that I'm successful, but I also don't think that I'm, I, I, I mean, you, I also don't necessarily think that I'm failed. Like, I don't, I just, I, I guess I never try to think, I guess the way that I avoid thinking about that is I just think about the thing that I'm going to do at the, in that few minutes. And then I just think about that. And I, I mean, that's probably not a great way to live, but I don't tend to think about my overall life project as a success or a failure. And I don't, I, I do think like, like you, I, I, I do, what you said did resonate with me because I felt like, so when I was, when I was little, I, I wanted to be this is going to sound so dumb. I wanted to be an American professional football player. It's all I wanted to do, even when I went to university. Uh, but then I, I just couldn't do that because I wasn't I didn't wasn't big enough. And so, but then I but but the other thing that I really loved is I read Jean Paul Sartre when I was I don't know uh, in high school, and I really like you. I I wanted to. That's what I wanted to do was think and and try to live philosophically whatever that means or theoretically and so i i i i just try to keep doing that i don't and i, I guess i didn't have the sense that that betrayed me in the way that you did so but but i i do think that it that you're right that it's a i i feel like it's a negative relation to a lot of things that are given like all all the things that were the givens in my early existence i i because of thinking theoretically or psychoanalytically I, I I took up a negative relation to that. So that 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 does I think that negativity that does resonate with me. But in terms of like overall success or failure, I just that I did I just so never think in those terms that I couldn't even say I, I do feel like if I go back to a book that I've written, I feel like it's terrible. So that I do I do that, that what you said did resonate with me because I never I don't feel like I've written any good books i feel like they're all pretty terrible so that i do i do feel that what you said did resonate on that but but otherwise i just i would just say i don't think in those terms and it's hard for me to think about my whole project and life as success or failure thank you Todd. alien catherine yeah, I don't know. I mean, I relate to this whole project very much through this notion, obviously, of the of the dead drive. Also, I do sometimes conceive it slightly differently, not necessarily more positively, or but in a kind of topologically slightly different uh, way. But perhaps I would um, say something um, to comment on your, you know, this kind of. Um, not the criticism or um, remorse that you have saying that perhaps you are not suffering enough to be making these claims about uh, whatever meaningless uh, of life. But I, I think that precisely what is important here is to keep alive this distinction, which is, for instance, very interesting he kept alive uh, in the theory of afro pessimism which is another theoretical pessimism that is uh, alive today and very much interesting i think for also conceptually is the distinction between empirical suffering and what they call ontological death you know there is some there is a difference it's not the um, like suffering olympics you know whoever suffers more is the only one who has the right to say okay now life is really uh, shit or water. This is an ontological claim, actually. It does not have necessarily to do with um, the amount uh, uh, of suffering. So this uh, acknowledgement of that as something that have, and for me, it's also important to say that that is precisely or uh, that or end is not an end point. For me, it's something that happens in the middle. 
and then you go on you know in in it's uh, there is uh, it's not simply the the end is not the end point it's uh, it's so it's for me extremely essential that you know this disillusionment all these things this is where you start this is not where you end up and give up or hope uh, but this is precisely when serious thinking kind of starts and you uh, you think out of this disillusionment not as a kind of a cynical or whatever uh, pessimistic wisdom that now but, but it's a kind of even depression or anxiety these are uh, also a kind of existential states that are more uh, that, that do not contain any kind of particular wisdom or worldview it is a certain kind of uh, thing that corners you and kind of forces you uh, even perhaps yeah uh, to go on when that and this is uh, precisely for me the definition of that drive it's not a drive that drives you towards death and destruction and negativity it's uh, actually uh, something that drives you on even when you are dead we are dead we are all dead <laughs> and that drive is precisely something which uh, animates this death uh, and uh, this is this is life and i think this is something that could be taken i mean that fright from time to time kind of hints at it it sounds kind of completely perhaps uh, crazy to say these things in this way but uh, uh, although he then comes up with all kinds of ways in which he tries to interpret uh, explain or whatever this dead drive uh, the, the least ex interesting thing is the way he divides it in the like and the dualism of the death of bad drives and life drives internal struggle this when this happens this kind of splitting a contradiction, a thing that is difficult to think in two things that then struggle with each other, you can be sure that this is the capitulation of re really real thinking. And <laughs> this is a kind of uh, a solution that never is actually, I mean, conceptual, that lacks something uh, more interestingly conceptual. So, yeah, I don't know. This uh, theme absolutely resonates with me and also this uh you know what you say actually already in the in the very um ded de dedication of your book to your uh, daughter when you say something like that she's uh the reason what what makes your uh death worth living this is precisely i think this is the lacanian point about the uh the death so it's not that now not, it's not that if if we're not for her you will you would keep kill yourself it is something that emerges out of this negativity precisely as what drives it forward and so anyway yeah i'll, I'll stop here for now so that catherine can, can say something thank you catherine yes well <laughs> uh i've never been asked such questions you know so i, I don't don't really know uh, how to take it well it, okay let's Let's take it uh, as as you phrased it. I mean, do I do I have a, a, a feeling of being a failure or a success? I mean, there's something that is very uh, striking for me is the uh, uselessness of philosophy. As a philosopher, I'm not helping anyone. I'm not saving lives. I'm not um, giving money to anyone, I have no power. I, I, I don't, I, I feel totally, um, I have this, like my colleagues here, this very uh, profuse intellectual energy, and this is for nothing. Uh, and, and if if I uh, felt myself as a failure, it would be uh, there, you know, as someone, being someone who constantly uh, produces, writes, <laughs> and at the same time does nothing, absolutely nothing to be, yes, to help the others. Um, and, and this has been always my problem in life. I never, I was never able to, to uh, jump, to jump over the gap that separates theory from practice. For example, I, I'm very uh, interested in psychoanalysis. I couldn't have become a psychoanalyst myself. I'm very interested in politics. At the same time, I'm not a militant, you see? So if I, yeah, if I were to define myself as a failure, it would be like that, like this kind of um, uh, anthropic, entropy, you know? 
uh, incredible energy for nothing. So it it could be it could be beautiful, you know. Bataille has written about expenditure, etc. <laughs> but it can also be terrible, and and I and I see it more uh, terrible than beautiful. Thank you, Catherine. So we are all dead, and we are all useless. <laughs> I, I wouldn't say I don't think it, it is uh, uh I agree with uh, Alenka that it's not necessarily uh dead in the sense of uh, uh utter negativity as you presented it, because um paradoxically there is life in all this chaos. Uh yeah, so but oh. it's it's a feeling of uh yeah, nothingness. Which is perhaps different. I mean, might be we might uh, perhaps differentiate between uh, death and nothingness. Because mm -hmm. I really think uh, relating, sorry, to to what Twin uh, just said. Uh, uh, you know, there is this interesting thing about life that really Freud kind of uh, uh, formulates uh, really intriguingly in the sense when he portrays uh, like death as, as some kind of a uh, something that basically coincides with pleasure principle, you know, this in, in, inanimate matter just kind of silently enjoying itself peacefully with no disturbances. And life appears as a disturbance of this self-enjoying inanimate matter. So something, it's not that life is uh, inherently positive. We kind of, uh, I mean, there is a certain philosophical or ideological perspective that uh, div the divides life and death in these terms. Life is positivity and death is negativity. But uh, there, there, there is this really interesting idea that he just very briefly toys with, right? When uh, basically it appears that life is the disturbance of something that is actually, so the life introduces the negativity in the, uh, in the inanimate uh, thing kind of enjoying itself. So it, it, I think it's it's interesting and it precisely this is why these things not coincide with themselves directly, like the end, the death, negativity. There is something more that takes place uh, in here, yeah. But uh, yeah, are we useless as philosophers? Uh, of course, uh, yeah, we are, but in a way, and this is not about me or you or whoever, but there is a certain way in which uh, basically philosophy is, is not simply thinking, it is more really thinking about thinking. But uh, at the same way, I think this kind of is not, this thinking about thinking is not simply something that removes us even further from reality, from, the, from le uh, whatever real, the others, but in a way can bring us closer in a kind of uncanny way but still so i don't know there is this um philosophy as such is uh is useless but you know i mean this is even a kind of obvious thing in capital in capitalism useless things are the most useful so it's not even <laughs> necessary i mean this useless uh, surplus it's what drives capitalism so i'm not saying that this is philosophy but the very question of is useless really always useless or is it something that uh, is part of another economy or mm -hmm. could be driven so perhaps it's good to uh, kind of uh, uh, precisely the, the, the this other kind of uselessness also no is, I, I should have perhaps yeah. uh, specified that it's not, it was not uh, meant against what you said, sorry, not... not no, no, to, but to, you're yeah. right that, for example, Plato said it, uh, he was the first to say it, that philosophy was not useful in the sense of uh, uh, well, economic reality, etc., that it was, um, uh, in a sense, useless. But in this uselessness, you nevertheless had something like guidance, um formation of young people's minds etc so it was a, it was a kind of uh, useful uselessness uh because of this function of guidance and this i think is lost um so i agree with you that perhaps we 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 are close to people but at the same time um i think i don't have anything to tell them uh in order to Yes, to to show them where to go or to to to, mm. to, to suggest any kind of uh, way, you know. <laughs> this is what I meant. I think a thought would say that we are given nothing, 
to, and that's very important. Todd, would you agree that we are using? Yeah, yeah, I think that's really good. I I think that Alinka's point about the 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 way that Freud sometimes will will compromise and say there's an opposition between left eros and death drive. I think that's that's really a bad. That's a very not. It's a mm -hmm. he sinks from. He moves from dialectics to dualism when he does that, and I think it's really, I think it's really important that the 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 the, the insertion of that 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 really what animates our life is is this is this negativity or 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 encounter with nothingness, and so I think that that in that sense it's not it, it, it is depressing, but it's also the thing that fuels us that moves us forward, and I think one of the I mean, this is a Hegelian point. This is like it's a psychoanalytic point that the thing that is the thing that is destroying us is also the thing that's in pushing us forward. So I think those you have to think those two things together. I think Catherine's point about the about the uselessness, I really feel that. Like I really feel students often will come to me and say, What yeah. am I gonna do? I love theory. What am I gonna do with this? I'm, I I say to them, sorry. Like yeah. it's just like yeah. there's not even good jobs. It's like sorry. Yeah. So we, we can't even that, help them find a job. <laughs> no, you can't help them find a job. You can't. There's not. If they go to graduate school, they're just postponing the inevitable. So I really feel this sense of. At the same time, I feel like, I feel this. I have this total sense that I'm not doing anything to help anybody else. I completely feel that way. And then to myself, the way I justify it is, I I try to spend an inordinate amount of time like answering emails that I get for a. Think, help about something and I so I say like okay I don't do anything in this other way but I'm going to try to do a little bit in this like do whatever I can in this realm even though I know ultimately it's totally useless so I really feel this that in that I guess this comes back to this I this is a sense I really Catherine made me think this that I really feel the a sense of my own failure like to not be helpful to people and and I don't I know and the way that I'm helpful it's just it, it's not doing them any good, although I do want to question the idea of the good anyway. So this comes back to Alenka's point about the the value of of inutility, right? Like there's some there's some value to that. And how are philosophers and psychoanalysts or just philosophers maybe different from other people? Because um, I used to have a feeling of superiority when I was much younger, that you know more, that you are useful. And now I think that, and I still think it was the right choice to become a philosopher. I think it, it, that unlike, they're more pathetic, so they're less wise, and that the value in this. How do you think now philosophers are different from those who are not philosophers? All of you. You should call on someone. <laughs> <Go on. laughs> uh, I didn't mean to call on me. Uh, I don't, I don't, that's a good, it's a great, I, you sent this question to us and I thought about it. Uh, I, I don't know that I feel that different from people. Like I feel, I, I feel obviously like everyone alienated from everyone that I'm around and I hate interacting with other people. That's uncomfortable for me. Uh, but I don't feel like I don't certainly don't feel superior, and I maybe I feel like you suggested kind of inferior. Uh, but I I I I I sort of think that I'm I feel like I'm trying to understand what it is to be to have a normal existence or or abnormal, right? Because there is no such thing as a normal existence. But I don't feel I don't feel that I'm when I. I used to, I used to, my kids played hockey and I used to go talk with these parents of, that are hockey parents and, and they were the, the, the they would be the, the, what is, what is, what does Charles Foster Kane say? They were a cross section of the American public. And, and I felt like, I didn't feel, I felt like just sort of on their, in the same situation as them. So I, I don't, I, I mean, I do try to, when I, when I interact with, I don't know, whatever people that are outside of, theory or philosophy i try to uh find out something right like find out but but i don't feel i don't i guess i don't feel that different from i don't think theory makes or philosophy separates in that radical way thank you Todd. Alenka. yeah i i think 
similar to what uh, Todd said, I don't really feel that um, I'm so different from other people. But on the other hand, I think other people do think that I'm different <laughs> from them. So perhaps <laughs> this is uh, this is more the, that one should take this seriously. I mean, because uh, I know, in, I even remember, you know, when I was for a while, I was studying in Paris and with a friend there. We sometimes, I mean, like two times per year. And it's not that we did it all the time, but we went like clubbing, like some clap and then stay there and dance to the till the, the morning and so on and okay we were both kind of single then and guys would come up and ask necessarily what do you do you know and I soon discovered that if I said I'm a philosopher or a philosophy this was a complete you know even in Paris which is notoriously about uh, philosophy being a sexy thing but this was not my experience so we ended up answering this question like oh we were nurses or something you know, like this no this is ridiculous but still I really think that uh, very often it is kind of off-putting for people when you uh, when you are a philosopher and there is this kind of, a, I, I wouldn't even say hostility, but this kind of um, malaise in comprehension of what exactly yeah, do you do and what does, and precisely because, yeah, we do nothing <laughs> that is of any kind of direct, uh, so that everything then runs on this kind of secondary, effect that you can have like somebody that people know and read and blah blah but this is this has nothing to do with the the, the matter of your work the stuff the substance of your work this is then a secondary surplus surplus use value of us as whatever kinds of people that uh, can sell these ideas and perhaps help people when they read them or whatever but uh it, it is there is something a certain glitch when it comes to this kind of uh, yeah philosophical thinking that uh, um, it's a kind of an estrangement or whatever for uh, framedungs effect, but there is also perhaps a certain kind of madness that one is obsessed so much that really one wants to think what thinking is and go even further and further uh, there. And I think the. But again, if we say, okay, we are crazy, this also sounds as a kind of uh, romantic uh, self-praise, you know, yeah, 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 we are crazy, but this is why we are so great, you know, <laughs> this is not what I mean. But there is a certain moment of madness or or something that comes close, not like clinical madness, but something that something throws you out of joint and you just follow this and you, you, you pursue this through thinking and it is uh, a kind of um, crazy enterprise but at the same time and this has nothing to do immediately with it but i also noticed that as far as there is this idea more and more in the parts of the world where we live like your europe U us and so on uh, that philosophy and this thing is, is really something that is out and outdated and whatever useless and so on but i also perceive that on what we would call a kind of periphery of our world there is a growing interest i mean people from south america in africa is i mean that there there is a lot of it's not at all that you would say where people are perhaps even much more in a much less privileged position that people in europe or in the states are to uh, think philosophically to have even the, the the privilege the leisure to 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 just think and read uh, it doesn't really work people who are in in circumstances who live in circumstances that are much worse than ours here in this whatever central part of Europe and of uh, US uh, the uh, there is something that philosophy uh, can achieve their achieve i mean uh, not a kind of help uh, but something that uh, a certain um good negativity or kind of uh, liveliness that uh, that is not at all i think something to be simply dismissed that people do read philosophy in most strange places that, that, that you don't necessarily hear because it's not academia necessarily it's not uh, this, but uh, still, uh, it exists, and this kind of thinking, philosophical thinking, I don't think uh, it's simply dead or out. There is interest for this, but not in the economic centers of the world, perhaps. Thank you, Alenka. Catherine, you partially answered this question, mentioning uselessness, but if you want to add anything. Well, at the same time, uh, I don't know why, I, I feel always um, 
already uh, i feel that i always have to defend it um at, well at, philosophy is useless and at the same time um i i feel like i have a kind of task which is to defend it whenever it is attacked and in particular and todd you said philosophy and theory i don't know if i understood you well are the same i don't think so uh, I think that too often people are confusing, let's say, European philosophy, because this is the kind of philosophy I'm doing, with a critical theory or a theory in general. And I think that it is a kind of danger, you know, because um, it, uh, I mean, the way in which some people, at least, do critical theory is, um, in fact, uh, a deconstruction or uh, perhaps even a dismantlement of uh, the philosophical tradition. And in that sense, you know, reading with my students, reading Plato, Hegel uh, is very important and not doing always gender theory or I don't know what, you know, uh, is very important. So I, I mean, I'm, I'm in a kind of contradiction because on the one hand, uh, I feel this is useless, as I said, and, and on the other, uh, I really want to defend it. You think that's an important, Catherine, do you think that's an important distinction? Because I know, I yes. guess for me, like I, I think of, I, I, I teach the, I teach, I mean, I mostly teach Kahn and Hegel, so yes, I, I teach, and, and I just call that theory. So I just, I just use the same. No, but I mean, you know, Todd, when uh, I suppose you have the same reactions, for example, you teach a class on Hegel and you have the usual uh, critiques, like he was a racist, he was, a, nah, 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 nah. And, and, and certainly, you know, uh, the discussion changes ground and, and, and we start discussing things that in my view are a bit external to um, the core problems. Yeah. It's kind of yeah. thing. Yeah, I, 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 I know, of course that happens. It, and, and so you think that that turn away is that you would call that theory and you would call the core problems philosophy. I wonder why some people, uh, I think it started with Anna Arendt who said, mm -hmm. I'm not a philosopher, I'm a theorist. Right. Huh? Right. Uh, it means something, no? Yeah. And the need for the, that kind of substitution, I think it means something. I think yeah. it meant okay. basically very much kind of moving of the moving away from, let's say, ontological investigation, which was immediately deemed as metaphysical, necessarily metaphysical, to something that uh, then kind of uh, narrowed down the scope of what is the legitimate whatever or yes, even productive. I, I personally yeah. don't want to go away from the metaphysical. Yeah. No, no, I, <laughs> I, 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 I think that's, we are that's, here you know, um, in agreement, yeah. Yes, yes, I, exactly. I think Alenka is right. I mean, theory is more uh, politically focused, maybe less ontologically and less metaphysically perhaps and for me i think that both can coincide i don't want i, I don't see why we should give up um i don't know the question of being or whatever right but i guess i guess what i would i i, the, I just use them as synonyms so that, this is just a term way that i use the signifier but i would just say that i think when people think they're just like even Arendt, when she thinks she's just talking about politics they're always ontological yes. implications to what she's talking about so i just part i guess for me that's why i want to break down that distinction because i don't think the people that think they're just doing theory are not doing they're doing ontology they just maybe not don't aren't aware that they're doing ontology but they no, they no, still absolutely. are and so that's what i want to that's i guess that's why i do that 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 thing with the signifier but i i see your point i mean i and i i, I lament that I always want to think the way, I mean, this is, I think, the great merit of what is sex is that you're thinking about a psychoanalytic problem with its ontological and a political mm -hmm. yes, problem exactly. with its ontological yeah. implications. And I think that I always want to try, I mean, I think that's a model text for that reason, because it doesn't, it doesn't say, it doesn't say, oh, we can just, Arendt's interesting too, because she's like, I think she's in a way trying to distinguish herself from Heidegger when she's when she makes that statement. Yeah. Like he's doing ontological specu speculation. I'm doing just I'm just in the political realm. Right. I have one last question for you before I let you go. 
actually two questions mixed together. If uh, writing a book is anxious process, we know that Todd feels anxious after he writes the book that he stopped liking the book that he wrote, even though those are great books. And another question, if you want, if your children respect you for uh, being a philosopher and for writing a book, because my daughter completely doesn't appreciate me dedicating a book for her. So a person who really matters, uh, her opinion on me, <laughs> doesn't respect me for this uh, at all. Is it the same with you? Todd? Uh, I, I have to start off with, uh, my, yeah, I have an anxious, I, 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 I don't like looking at a book that I've written after I've written it. So that's, I just don't like to look at it. And I, I, when people tell me they've, they're reading it, or when you say what you just said, that made me feel terrible. So I don't, I, I don't like to be complimented on it. I hate, to, I, and I, I, I hate to be introduced at places where they go through the list of all, and I'm like, okay, that's shameful. I wish about the kids. Uh, I've, I dedicated my book on David Lynch to my kids. And I said, uh, they allowed me to understand a racer head, and that was a little uh, joke. And, and then I decorated my book on comedy to them. Uh, they, I don't know what they think. They like what they say. They think I'm a kind of buffoon. So they, they, they think that they, they. So they, I think they think that all of the. But at the same time, I don't. They, they I don't know. Maybe they. Maybe there's a other kind of thing there. But I do think that they. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what it. I, I I I'm kind of I don't know that I would even want to ask them because I I would feel that would be too like oh I'm how do you view this great you know I just think that that's I would be I would feel like very anxious about what they said back to me and but I I don't think that they I, I mean I have a very good I, my relation with them is very good so I, I have twins that are they're now 19 so but they they it's an interesting thing so i'm sorry for talking too much um but they 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 go to university of vermont and people will teach a work by me in their in a class that they take and they that's for them a really it's a horror show it's really a, they don't like to they they don't want to have to and in fact one of them got accepted out, they're like i can't re i have to have another reading assignment because i can't read that thing so i don't i don't know what that I think it's just too, you know, it's just too proximate to to have that. What, what are they studying? So the one is a film. The one is a the one is pre med and an English major. So it's a, and the other one is a is a film student. So they're right in the they're right in the wheelhouse of of me. So thank you, Todd. Alien. Yeah. You know, I, I can relate to many things that Todd just said. I mean, one is this relation to the text once you write it and send it away. Uh, and it kind of uh, becomes this terrible thing that you can really not, uh, not even not relate to, but it's kind of source of the horror. And I'm reminded of an example, I think that uh, Slavo uses at some point, you know, about uh, spitting how saliva is part of you integral part of you it's something that you normally have in your mouth great and then it is enough just to spit in a glass and then immediately drink it back you cannot do this the moment it's out it's already a foreign terrible uh, horrifying thing which you can no longer reintegrate in the kind of immediacy of your self of your being and so on and i think this is also what happens with uh books that uh, for me uh, after many many years then sometimes i read something that i uh, that i wrote and it is uh, even something you know you forgot very often at least it happens to me all the time i forget <laughs> even what i then so you are sometimes kind of even pleasantly surprised so oh this is interesting you know <laughs> but this after 10 years or this, there are something but immediately after it i i have this kind of uh like like yeah, drinking your speech, it's not a good thing, you cannot do it. Uh, yeah, no anxiety, I don't know, right? For me, I have different experiences for book from uh, different books. Some were written more kind of, even uh, there is only one that was really written in a kind of a very, very easy way. It kind of just literally, I, I mean, I know this is a, a cliche, it didn't, obviously didn't write itself, but it was this kind of a very easy 
thing, and it's a short thing, the, the, the Antigone book, but uh, the rest of my books, uh, it, it was a very different work process, so I don't know uh, the different, uh, but there is always a certain anxiety, I guess, in me, at least, uh, that accompanies this, uh, this thing, but also uh, this kind of not paralyzing anxiety, but the one that kind of uh, also drives you forward to some extent. Uh, I don't know, kids, this is, I I have a funny story because, okay, I have my kid, my only kid when I was already 42. And uh, I remember when he was nine years old or something, or perhaps 10, uh, he got uh, the uh, Alexa, you know, this uh, device that's kind of the Oracle thing, you know, connected to the internet. I didn't even know what this strange magical um Paul was uh, that he would ask it things and it would answer. Uh, and so at some point he was playing with it and he asked the thing, um, who is the Zubancic? And the thing actually answered, you know. And this was for him the moment. I mean, this was so funny, you know, not not simply, I mean, we, in psychoanalysis, we would say you you exist in big other, his big other at least. But if you if Alexa knows who you are, then you really are standing. And this was the first moment when I realized that actually this changed everything for him that now okay you are doing your thing i mean uh the philosophy that he doesn't relate to this immediately i mean he's still very young but uh there this kind of uh universe of these younger generations where uh yeah this kind of uh, for me miracle devices then and even for him it was a kind of he didn't uh, ex uh expect this to happen he just it was meant as a job and then the thing started to to talk so this was uh, this was very funny so i definitely uh, did gain some esteem then when alexa knew about them which basically means wikipedia or whatever but still there is this uh there was this gap you know this kind of it came from elsewhere then from the intimacy of our home of our relationships or whatever i can say to him or he to me so this was funny how old is he now uh he's now 14. Thank you, Alianka. Catherine? Oh, well, you know, I'm, I'm so naive. I always expect uh, each time I write a book, uh, I'm expecting the ideal reader. Like and the ideal reader would be someone who would be able to draw my own conclusions for me. You know, like, OK, you said that and it means that. Um, and who would um, mirror the book? Like, this is what you've been doing, you know, because uh, the anxiety for me is that I, I'd never know what exactly I've been doing uh, when I wrote this or that book. And, of course, uh, the encounter with the uh, miraculous reader uh, will never, won't ever happen. I know that. Um, my son is now 26, and he's a surgeon. He's a hand surgeon. And I think th this... Uh, precisely, um, I, he has uh, respect for me, uh, but uh, I think the the point is what I was saying in the beginning, that I think he found a way to make me feel <laughs> that I was a bit useless, and that he at least <laughs> would be able to cure my hand <laughs> if I had a problem with the computer, you know, uh, so, so yes. But, well, everything is fine with him, no problem. But we're doing very different things. But I want to ask you, uh, uh, Julie, if it's not too uh, personal, why, I, why did you present yourself in such a desperate way, if I may ask? Maybe uh, as a kind of experiment, at least. Uh, and the, the very thing that it... Uh, it it is something that needs justification, right? Or I'm very grateful for you that you uh, no one tried to make me feel better, <laughs> <laughs> which is like only in the collect uh, only in a collective of philosophers you can allow yourself to do it. <laughs> Thank you, and maybe also as an experiment, I, I wrote a long time ago the essay on depressive realism, which started to be weirdly very popular, meaning that the depressive realism is not depression is not a distortion just presenting the perspective but there may be actually adequate uh, perception of reality not something that needs correction but it's the mood 
like maybe Heideggerian uh, basic mood. And it surprisingly started to be very popular. So people do feel it uh, and it, they can relate to it. And um, they not, not necessarily want to be um, rescued from this space. So I, uh, after this, I'm just trying to stay in this space and explore it. And uh, maybe there's, there are other possibilities for me of <laughs> better life, but I'm genuinely trying to see it even as my function. Um, like there are people, professional more people who are invited to funerals to mourn mm -hmm. other people. And this is the function. Different people have different functions. Some people have function of cheering others up and I have function of, <laughs> it's not the best one, but I'm trying to be mm, devoted to this space without escaping it and just see what will happen. And I, the uh, idea that I'm already, uh, I already died and there is nothing to lose anyway, just explore the space here. It helps um, to, to do it. But like different people do different weird things to lose their lives. <laughs> and I think you are a philosopher and understand the creativity and appreciate the creativity of this position. Yeah, so I won't keep you any longer. I'm very extremely grateful for you uh, showing up to this discussion, and I hope to discuss something else maybe less depressing <laughs> in the future, or maybe more depressive. Let's see. Well, I'm uh, grateful for more, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be my success. Thank you so much. Thank you, Julia. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.